While picking up a shift for UPS, the Enterprise delivers some packages to and picks one up from the Tantalus Penal Colony. When an apparent inmate from Tantalus pops out of the box, he tells a tale of the goings-on there to Kirk and the gang, and they are forced to investigate. What they find puts Kirk and crew in peril from another mad scientist who wields a dagger of the mind. Hit it! Hey! So we got three awesome guest stars in this episode. First, you got Marianna Hill as psychologist Dr. Helen Noel. Like most Star Trek guest stars, she showed up in lots of shows, including such sci-fi genre titles as The Original Batman, Wild Wild West, Mission Impossible, and an episode of The Outer Limits called I, Robot, which also starred Lena Nimoy. Despite the title, the story isn't based on Isaac Asimov, though it is based on a story by Iendo Binder, which is a clever nom de plume of the brothers Earl and Otto Bender, who were an influence of Dr. Asimov. So, next best thing, eh? That episode also had Star Trek actors John Hoyt, Peter Brocko, and Vic Perrin. Next up, you got James Gregory as Dr. Tristan Adams. This guy did a lot of guest spots too, but is probably best known for his role as Inspector Luger in 66 episodes of Barney Miller. You kids out there don't know from Barney Miller, but it's a classic. You should check it out. Jimmy Gregg here is also known for his role in The Manchurian Candidate, which has some similar themes as this episode, but I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Lastly, you got Morgan Woodward as Dr. Simon Van Gelder. This guy was all over the place, mainly in westerns, cop shows, and sci-fi shows. He was in 18 episodes of Gunsmoke, each time as a different dude. Other sci-fi appearances include The X-Files, that weird Logan's Run TV show, Knight Rider, Millennium, and the Roger Corman disaster piece, Battle Beyond the Stars, which we may have to do a video on. But I digress. Let's get into the plot. The Enterprise rolls up on the Tantalus Penal Colony with some Amazon packages to deliver. When the transporter guy tries to beam them down, it don't work. Kirk comes in and says, it's a penal colony. They got a force field. What's wrong with you? He calls the colony and gets them to cut the field off, and they send down the stuff. They also pick up a big box from the colony to deliver to Earth. Kirk sighs and wonders why he thought signing up to be a DoorDash driver was a good idea. After telling the transporter guy to go read the manual on how to be a transporter guy that doesn't suck, Kirk leaves. While the technician's back is turned in the transporter room, the box opens and a crazy-eyed dude comes out, sneaks up on a guy, and judo chops him out cold. On the bridge, Kirk is telling McCoy about Dr. Tristan Adams, the head of the Tantalus colony, and how he's shaped the way the Federation treats incarceration and the rehabilitation of criminals. McCoy says, meh, a cage is a cage. Kirk scoffs at McCoy, and just then, the Tantalus colony calls up the ship and says they lost one of their crazy guys, and he may have been in that huge crazy guy-sized box they just beamed up. Just then, Crazy Guy manages to change clothes with the tacky whack and goes out into the corridors looking around all crazy and not being conspicuous in the least. He's immediately spotted, surprise, surprise, and the search is on. Well, yada, 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 he makes it to the bridge and demands asylum. Kirk and Spock do the shirtless Sulu special, Kirk distracting him while Spock brings the nerve pinch. It's a classic. In sickbay, Kirk tries to get answers out of the Crazy Guy and he struggles to answer. It looks like he's trying to answer, but is also hit with some kind of pain or attack when he does. He manages to get out that his name is Simon Van Gelder. Spock Googles the guy and finds out that he's not an inmate. He was on the staff of Tantalus as Dr. Simon Van Gelder. McCoy points out that the regulations state that this type of thing has to be investigated, and Kirk orders the helmsman to bust a Yui and head back to Tantalus. Kirk tells McCoy that he's beaming down, but he needs someone from McCoy's staff that understands the psychology of rehabilitation. That turns out to be Dr. Helen Noel, somebody that apparently Kirk got a little friendly with at the science lab's Christmas party last year. He didn't call her back, though. Kirk's got a Kirk, you know? Well, as you might expect, things suddenly get a little awkward. Well, they beam down to the planet, and they go inside the building there. 
Immediately, the room does a tower of terror and plummets down to the penal colony, causing Kirk and Noel to hug one another. You know, like you do. They get to the bottom and they meet Dr. Tristan Adams, head of the Tantalus colony. He leads them to his office where he offers drinks and weirdly proposes a toast. To all mankind, may we never find space so vast, planet so cold, heart and mind so empty that we cannot fill them with love and warmth. Nothing hinky about that. Also, a therapist named Lethe comes in and Adams explains that she used to be an inmate. She was cured and chose to give back by working at the colony. In a totally non-suspicious, detached deadpan, she says, I love my job. Nothing hinky about that either. Well, that's all right then. Kirk tries to check in with the ship, but can't until Adams deactivates the force field. Somewhere on the Enterprise, a transporter technician goes, Hey! On a tour of the colony, Kirk, Adams, and Noel stroll past a room with a chair in it that has an inmate in it with a tantalus worker at the controls of a device in the next room. Adams explains that this is the neural neutralizer. Van Gelder was testing the neural neutralizer on himself when things went wrong and fried his noodle, making him go back cookies. He says that the device doesn't show much promise, but they're continuing to work on it. After they leave, the tech cranks the volume on the neural neutralizer and tells the inmate in the chair that he will forget everything he just heard and that to remember it will cause him great pain. The amount of non-hinky things going on around here is amazing. Up on the ship, McCoy and Spock are trying to get through to Van Gelder. Spock decides to use the ancient Vulcan practice of the mind mill, though he doesn't use that name for it. He does so and learns that Adams has been doing a lot of stuff to a lot of people, including Van Gelder, with that neural neutralizer. And he ain't been a nice guy with it. Kirk and Noel go back to the neural neutralizer room by themselves. Kirk wants to see how it works and gets Noel's opinion on if she can operate the machine on him safely. She assures him she can and he gets in the chair. She keeps the setting low and while it's on, she tells him he's hungry. She turns it off, and Kirk talks about wanting to raid a kitchen after they get done, although he has no memory of her telling him about being hungry. He wants to experiment further, and for her to put a suggestion in his head that's a little more unusual, so they can be sure that it's doing what it looks like it's doing. She turns it on, and starts to tell him a different version of what happened between them at the Christmas party. She starts to get a little saucy with it, and just then, Dr. Adams and that tech from before show up. The tech restrains Noel and Adams takes over the controls. He cranks up the volume and tells Kirk that he's madly in love with Dr. Noel and that it hurts him not to be with her. As he cranks it, it clearly causes Kirk a lot of distress. Later back in one of their rooms, Kirk is struggling with what the neural neutralizer is doing to his noodle. He tells Noel to do a John McClane through the air conditioning ducts and find the power room to shut off the security field so that Spock can beam down with a security team. She has to whack a guard, but she shuts down the power while Kirk is in the chair for another session, allowing him to fight Adams and knock him out. Spock beams down, turns the switches off for the force field, and then turns the power to the colony back on. Since the neural neutralizer controls were on when the power went out, it comes back on again when the power comes back on, and right as Adams is waking up. Since he had cranked the volume up to 11, the neural neutralizer fries Adams' brain butt good, and he collapses deader than cargo shorts. Well, all's well that ends well. See what I did there? Shakespeare, the dagger, the... Anyway. And Van Gelder is cured and takes over the Tantalus colony. He informs the Enterprise that he has dismantled and destroyed the neural neutralizer. Kirk had stated earlier that Adams died from being alone his mind emptied by the neural neutralizer without even a tormentor for company. McCoy remarks that it's hard to believe that a man could die from what is essentially loneliness. Kirk says, not when you've sat in that room. He then tells Spock to break orbit and let's get out of here warp factor one. The helmsman thinks to himself, hello, I'm sitting right here. And we roll credits. Great stuff. A couple of great lines and exchanges in this episode. Well, Bones, you've got the ball. You care to recommend a better place? There are no superior facilities. He knows that. But that's not the question. If something unusual is going on down there... An assumption, Doctor. I'm required to enter any reasonable doubts into my medical law. That requires you to answer in your law. 
Sorry, Jim. I've talked before about how the lack of McCoy can cause a certain seriousness to an episode. This is an example of how, even if he's not being funny or bringing any kind of levity, McCoy still brings a certain humanity to a show that can easily get up its own ass with its grim seriousness sometimes. Of the holy trinity of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, Bones is the voice of raw humanity, and he brings it to every scene he's in. Can't say enough about DeForest Kelly. I love that guy. Interesting. The Earth people glorify organized violence for 40 centuries, but you imprison those who employ it privately. And of course, your people found an answer. You disposed of emotion, Doctor. Where there's no emotion, there's no motive for violence. This is a nice little exchange between Spock and McCoy, one which will get repeated many, many times over the course of the series and the movies. It's, of course, debatable whether or not Spock's assertion is correct, or if the purging of emotion is the only way to remove the motive for violence, but it's a conversation that gets revisited a lot in the series, and this exchange is a great example. Who are we? We are Simon Van Gelder. Dr. Adams. The neural neutralizer. What did he do to us? He can reshape any mind he chooses. He used it to erase our memories. Put his own thoughts there. So lonely to be sitting there empty. Wanting any word from him. Love. Hate. Live. Die. Such agony to be empty. Not only does this set up the Vulcan mind meld as a thing that would be carried forward to all versions of Star Trek, but this scene, which could easily have been majorly silly, was pulled off beautifully by Leonard Nimoy and Morgan Woodward. Both actors take the scene very seriously, and the result is fantastic. Excellent commitment from both of these actors. Top notch. Don't hide for me. Please, don't hide for me. I'll try not to fight. I'll try. But you must listen. Warn you, Captain. Dr. Adam. Do Dr. Adams will destroy. Destroy how? What? Right? Death. Morgan Woodward does an amazing job in this episode. He plays a madman like nobody else. He's able to whip the crazy eyes on you and scare the bejesus out of you at the drop of a hat. In this scene, you can see when he disconnects from McCoy and Spock and stares at the ceiling, seeing in his mind the beam from the neural neutralizer, describing it as being like death. Woodward would go on to describe this as the most difficult part he ever played, and he was wiped out after the shoot, so much so that he just holed up in his house for four days, physically and mentally exhausted from portraying the crazed and tormented Simon Van Gelder. And all of that work and effort definitely paid off, though. This guy utterly kills it in every scene he's in. The way the episode's two sides of the plot work in conjunction with each other is really great. The information Spock and McCoy are getting out of Van Gelder, juxtaposed with Kirk and Noel at the colony doing their investigation, culminating with the sequence of events that puts an unconscious Adams on the floor of the neural neutralizer room when Spock innocently turns the power back on, just works so well. It almost feels choreographed how well the two subplots sync up. Great work by the writer there. More on the writer later, but now let's move on to... The Goof. So the logo of the Tantalus colony is interesting. It's a hand that seems to be grabbing a dove, like it's capturing it or keeping it under control. It's a very apt logo for the Tantalus colony under Dr. Adams' control. 
But I can never look at that logo without seeing the freakishly large thumb on that hand. That guy got no problems hitchhiking with that thumb. Look at that. It's all I can see. So the scene with the transporter guy seemed like a clumsy way to introduce the fact that the Tantalus colony had a security force field. All Kirk had to say was, we're beaming stuff down to a penal colony for the tech to figure out what was wrong. So he clearly already knew about these kinds of fields and that penal colonies have them. I know some people suck at their jobs, but I would think a transporter tech on the Enterprise would know something like this already and not be all, what? when beaming stuff down doesn't work. Especially when later, Kirk makes the same mistake when he tries to call the ship with a security field on. Looks like Lieutenant Dingleberry ain't the only one that needs to reread the manual, huh? And finally, I like that when the elevator suddenly starts shooting downwards toward the penal colony, the instinct is apparently for Kirk to hug Noel. Shades of Gary Mitchell reaching back and grabbing the hand of Yeoman Smith when they went through the pink thing. Apparently, step one, when encountering any unexpected turbulence or other sudden violent movement, is grab the nearest female. This will happen lots more as we go, though. Rumination. So, a few things to talk about here. One is, does anyone else get a Gina Davis vibe off of Dr. Noel? I couldn't shake it the whole time I watched this episode. This isn't one I usually revisit when I want to scratch that original series itch. So it had been a while since I'd seen this one, but it really stuck out to me. You know, that character was originally supposed to be Yeoman Rand, but they didn't think it made sense for Kirk to sit in the chair with Rand at the controls since she wouldn't be a psychiatric professional. Also, they didn't want the sexual tension between Rand and Kirk to get as overt as it would have gotten considering what happens in this episode. Now, this isn't a rumination so much as just an interesting bit of trivia, but it doesn't really go anywhere else. The whole reason the mind meld even exists is because NBC's Broadcast Standards Department sent a note expressing concern with using hypnosis to get the information out of Dr. Van Gelder, which was the original plan. They said, quote, In accordance with the precautions to avoid hypnotizing a viewer, the act of hypnotizing must be either out of context or done off camera. Further, since you are portraying hypnotism as a legitimate medical tool, Van Gelder should be hypnotized by Dr. McCoy rather than Mr. Spock, unless Mr. Spock can be established as being qualified in the use of this technique. Not only is it funny that they wanted to make sure that it's clear to the audience of a show with people going through space and fighting salt vampires and whatnot that hypnosis is not something that should be attempted by anyone other than a medical professional, They were honestly concerned that Star Trek would inadvertently hypnotize people watching the show. But as goofy as that is, and it is very, very goofy, it's funny how it led to one of the most iconic aspects of Spock's character and Vulcans in general and would shape so much of Star Trek lore even up to today. Weird, right? Another bit of trivia is that this episode is credited to S. Bar David as the writer. That's a pseudonym for Shimon Winselberg, whose original script went through so many rewrites by Gene Roddenberry and John D.F. Black that he had his name taken off of the episode credits. In his original script, instead of hypnosis or a mind meld, Spock used a truth beam to get the information out of Van Gelder. Dr. Adams, who was called Dr. Asgard in his version, had a device that could look into the minds of the inmates and see all the nightmarish things in there in full motion video. All kinds of crazy stuff they wouldn't have been able to do on the budget they had. The gist of the story was still the same, though. By the way, Dr. Asgard's name was changed to Adams because producer Bob Justman was worried it would bring to mind, quote, some kind of back-end protection. I can't say he's wrong. That's what comes to my mind every time someone says Asgard in a Marvel movie. (laughs) <laughs> Ask God. Why? What do you want from me? I'm a possum over here. So, an actual rumination here. The episode has a couple of different things to say. One that I think isn't terribly controversial is that if you have to lobotomize someone to get them to stop being a criminal, that's not really a good thing. And also, once you have that power to forcibly change minds one tends to start using that power in ways it wasn't intended to be used. It's a pretty standard power corrupts kind of message, and we've certainly seen it before in this show. Just last episode, for instance. 
Another question that seems to be asked by the episode is, what is the purpose of imprisonment? This one is a lot more controversial, and the opinions people have on this question tend to be passionate. I don't want to start any arguments or nothing. I'm just a possum talking about Star Trek over here. But I will say this. Poverty tends to be the primary motivation behind a huge chunk of crime here in the 21st century. Desperate people turn to desperate measures. In the world of Star Trek, though, we're given to understand that poverty has been largely wiped out, thanks in large part to the matter replicator and the matter-antimatter reactor. Once poverty is eliminated, it seems like the criminal element would tend more toward the mentally ill. If your needs are being met by Federation society and advanced technology, crime becomes a lot more of an elective endeavor. Crimes of passion would still exist, but even that could probably be seen as a mental problem. So in that kind of post-scarcity society, does it make sense for penal colonies to lean heavily toward the rehabilitation side of the question? Once everybody is fed, sheltered, clothed, free to seek their fulfillment however they wish, be it in Starfleet or as a member of a science team or an artist or through travel or whatever, can we say that the urge to commit crime in such an environment would be likely due to some form of mental instability and thus best treated with psychiatric intervention? It's an interesting question that I don't have the answer to. Well, I don't have an answer any more helpful than, well, it depends. But that's one of the things Star Trek is best at, right? Dropping these questions like a golden apple and running away giggling like Eris while we're all arguing about it, am I right? What? Well, anybody who already picked up on the names Tantalus and Lethe got that joke. Well, there you have it. Dagger of the mind. What did you think of this episode? Was there any great stuff or goof that I missed? Let me know about it down there in the comments. And while you're down there, hit that thumbs up button so as I know you dug the episode. And subscribe to the channel so as you don't miss any of the fun of watching stuff with me. Possum Ra. If you're someone who likes the sci-fi hit shows The Expanse and Babylon 5, let me invite you to join the channel. I'm doing a watch through of both shows and channel membership gives you access to my full episode commentary track. New episodes of both every week, so come watch with us. And don't forget, we got merchandise over at adstudiosmerch.com. Grab a t-shirt or a coffee mug over there. It's like minus 900 degrees in some places, so wouldn't you like to have a Possum Rob mug to sip some hot mold Tranya from? Of course you would, and we got you covered. Next time, the Enterprise visits the first of many parallel Earths where a disease turns you crazy and then kills you as soon as you hit puberty. Logan's Run meets The Walking Dead in Miri. Until then, possum friends are awesome friends. Take it easy, all right? Later. Hey!